<laughs> gotta love the net. Folks, we are live. Really excited. I've got a wonderful guest. Melissa, how, how do you pronounce your last name? Tittle. Awesome. Okay. Melissa Tittle is with Gaia. She is a producer, a world-class author, as well as director. And she's also very knowledgeable in the electric universe. So we're going to discuss a lot of details about stuff that we were told in school that isn't even close. Like, I'll give you a quick example. I was taught in school, the Grand Canyon has been carved out over millions and millions and millions of years from water. Well, I've got some pretty good evidence that's in stone that's also confirmed by people like you, Wall Thornhill, et cetera, talking about these giant plasma bolts that came from space, you know, whether it be from uh, Venus or some type of solar discharge that created those canyons like less than 15,000 years ago. So that's crazy. And I am so excited to hear the information you have to say, Melissa, you've been researching this so long. You've got an awesome library. Folks, you need to check out Gaia. If you haven't been to Gaia yet, go to Gaia.com slash leak project. You can actually watch these videos for free. Um, Wall, Thornhill, others that talk about the electric universe. And, and Melissa, you've just done a wonderful job putting these together. So thanks for coming on the show. How the heck are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Oh, I've yeah. I've these with you before, so this is awesome. This is fantastic. I am so excited. Um, I, I love your work. And I was shocked that, I mean, you've got, I was looking at your resume and you've worked with so many different networks and done so much work in regards to not only the electric universe, but other space related documentaries. I'm just really excited to, to hear what you have to say. So to get started, tell us just a little bit about yourself. And then I want to jump into the EU. Uh, where do you want me to start with me? <laughs> like, well, how did you get into this? Like, what, uh, what okay. led you down this path? Um, well, I, um, I was in Los Angeles, worked in TV and film. And uh, I've always been fascinated with mysterious things. And, and as a journalist, I think, like, um, the problems in the world are good to cover. But what is the root of it? And I just kept digging and digging and digging. And uh, I was working in film. I was working at Paramount Studios, actually. And I got an offer to produce uh, a show called The Universe on the History Channel. So this is this dates me a little bit. But um, this is purely just space. Like, I'm just dealing with NASA. I'm, I'm like, literally covering mainstream science. And um, I still had more questions. And um, I ended up getting an offer to work on the first five seasons of Ancient Aliens. And... Um, that like opened up like obviously the knowledge that I had from what we do know and then of course some other doors that were pretty fascinating so yeah I've kind of been digging around this space for quite some time. Now the, I, I love the ancient aliens and the ancient astronaut series and I, I like how they've connected the dots from around the world and the more research I've done with the petroglyphs and the stuff in stone oftentimes even what looks like maybe ETs, some of that stuff might have actually been from the EU or, or like when I say the EU, I'm just talking about these plasma events that people were seeing in the heavens and they're writing stuff down really quick because I know Parat and others have done experiments with plasma in laboratories where they were able to get um, almost identical results as not only the Grand Canyon, the Canyonland, but many of these petroglyphs. Yeah. Um, can you share some of that information that you have compiled on that? Yeah, of course. Um, this was a really interesting project because uh, I had heard of the Electric Universe, uh, but then I had the opportunity to sit down with Wall, Thornhill, and Ev um, to kind of talk about the theory. And the, the interesting part of it was it, it kind of makes sense. Like as crazy as it seems, uh, maybe not for your audience, but for other people in the mainstream, they're like, that's insane. Um, all of their evidence, and especially with working with Tony Pratt, who's uh, at Los Alamos, I, I believe. Um, the uh, idea that all these symbols were symbols that our ancient ancestors saw in the sky uh, based on a, a plasma interaction that was happening between, plasma, uh, between planets. Um, and the show goes into that a little bit more technically about how that could happen uh, because we're in a different kind of solar system and we were seeing things in the sky we had never seen before. So as ancient people all over the world, they were all seeing the same image and what they did with that image was they created uh, you know, certain religious type of symbolism that we use today. Um, and the, the one that you're referencing is kind of like a stick man in the sky and you see, like you say, a lot of petroglyphs have this kind of carving of like this man and he's got two little round balls next to him 
and you're thinking, okay, well, that's cute. You know, maybe they're just drawing each other or <laughs> they're just, you know, marking that, you know, they were there or something that's their symbol, but, but it's a little odd because it's all over the world. So, you know, what is that stick man is just because people wanted to draw humans or were they saying, oh, this is the symbol that we saw in the sky at this point in time. Well, it, it's interesting because like I've been to the four corners region, um, Arizona, Utah, New Mexico and Colorado. And you're right that that squatting man. And oftentimes there's stuff that's coming out of his head. Yeah. And and if you think about it. Imagine plasma. And, and these, you know, these, these lightning bolts and stuff like that. And, and, and our ancestors are watching these things in the heaven. That totally makes sense. That, that, that totally explains it. And then you look at some of these um, hieroglyphics in Egypt and stuff of similar birds coming out of heads. And then you have to ask yourself, and I want to get your information, your thoughts on this. Do you think that the original gods and goddesses actually came from the planets and these events that they saw in the heavens? Um, I don't have a direct answer for that. However, uh, for the audience listening, their whole theory uh, revolves around the fact that at one point, Earth and Mars was not orbiting our current sun. It was orbiting Saturn, but we didn't see Saturn. We were covered in this kind of red mist, purple mist. Uh, it was like a, it's a red glow, but it, on Earth, it looks purple, right? So we were, we were totally covered. We didn't see any stars. We didn't see the sun. It's the constant amount of light every day. And we we're kind of living in this, this is their theory. We're kind of living in this kind of golden age utopia. There's always enough food. No one was fighting. There was always, there wasn't, there wasn't all this symbolism. There was no idea of what ha was out there beyond this mist, right? And then uh, of course, this also suggests that at one point, if Mars was orbiting at, with Earth, Saturn, that they would have had life similar to, to Earth, right? So uh, we're in the same predicament. When our current sun, this is the electric universe theory, came into contact with Saturn, because they believe everything's kind of run on these electric currents. So Saturn is, is acting as a, a red dwarf and um, an electrically charged so. And so when this bigger electrical charge, our current sun comes into contact with Saturn, it, um, it kind of shuts it off. It kind of deactivates the power that Saturn has, which means it can't hold Earth and Mars and they swing out of orbit. And it's the first time we see the stars and the sun and all this stuff happening in the sky. So this might have, this is a, this is a huge moment for earthlings, Martians, <laughs> because they get to see uh, all this interaction happening in the sky. Of course, this is not something that's happened in our lifetime, but, um, but all of this interaction then started to, um, to show all this, this plasmic interaction. So we're having plasmic interaction with Mars, uh, with Saturn, um, and some other planets that we can get to. <laughs> oh, okay. So if we could talk more about that, I'm fascinated with this, this veil around the planet and this utopia. And it's like the whole planet was a garden of Eve. I've heard a bit about that. Mm -hmm. Can you just, can you describe how that worked? I mean, so, so like our ancestors were walking around and, and they're looking out in the sky and it's, it's like a purplish veil kind of. Yeah. Um, but you know this it's like this uh this red glow that was around the the red dwarf planet and they've been doing a lot of studies and i'm not sure if if your audience is into like alternative health or anything but but there's also this this uh, infrared light that people are going to get healed and 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 it's the same kind of thing there's i think nasa did a study too where they uh they're doing all this the growing plants under like a red glow uh in space and i i can't I don't know exactly what the article is, but it was posted several years ago. So there's there's this kind of it's not a it's not a crazy theory that at one point we were kind of engulfed in this like perfect atmosphere for growing massive plants and animals and humans and massive amounts of growth uh, because this is something that's modern day right now we're we're finding out works um, and I, I you know according to to Wall. Uh, this is where some of those mat like dinosaurs and the the uh, the huge plants. I think that they found some evidence of these massive plants in Antarctica, I believe. 
uh, kind of, they're kind of like, well, when did these grow? <laughs> was this <laughs> the Jurassic period? Like, when was that? Um, so there's kind of this, these, these things that kind of piece together and make sense with their theory. Uh, and I think it completely makes sense given the modern day studies of this idea of, of peer growth under an, an infrared light. Yeah. Now that's, I hadn't heard that. That's fascinating. So that would explain why people live longer. If you read about some of the, whether it's biblical or ancient Sumerian tablets or uh, a mythos from another place in the world, it talks about at one point, you know, our ancestors living much longer. And now if you've got this healing light, wow, that's, that's an incredible dot connector right there. That's fascinating. So it was almost as if the whole planet was protected and people could live longer because they didn't have as much radiation, et cetera. There, there wasn't really wars and battles because everything was, was plentiful and bountiful. What happened? Like what ripped that veil out and changed the you know, change things? Yeah, that, well, that, that, their idea is that the, our current sun came into orbit and then deactivated Saturn, which if that's who we were orbiting. Uh, we would have lost our orbit with Saturn. So we had been kind of flung into the solar system, interacting with all the planets. Um, and, and of course, in their theory, everything is electrically connected. So uh, their idea of this with stars is that um, everything is kind of like on a, a string of beads, like all these stars are on the string of beads. So if you think of like street lights, if, uh, if all of these are electrically charged and connected and this other one moves in on, <laughs> I feel like I'm making no sense. I think you have to watch. No, this. you're making sense. No, you, you are. You're totally making sense. We, we're, we're with you. Um, that, uh, so this dramatic event is just an electrically charged event. So they, they Earth and Mars swing out of orbit. They're like basically trying to find a new orbit, which would be our current sun. And in that, this is the first time they see the stars. This is the first time they see the sun. And everything gets harder because they're not under this, this pure, like, you know, like just like the Garden of Eden, they're like all protected. And, and uh, of course, in that story, don't eat the apple from the tree. But for this, uh, because probably ancient people were trying to figure out why did we deserve this punishment? Because things got really hard. They have this massive sun beating down on them. People are, there's massive uh, earthquakes and floods, um, complete disaster. There's these electrical charges coming down from earth. You mentioned the Grand Canyon, so powerful that they were carving up stone. So people were living in this apocalypse and they uh, were running out of resources. You know, how do, where do they get water? How do they make, how do they have food? You know, food was just provided. Now they have to figure out how to plant it and grow it and survive. And then, so you have all these divisions of people um, fighting over resources. You know, that's interesting because if you look at the Bible in astrotheological theological terms, and if you look at Jesus as the son of our solar system and like a stargate, the only way through the father is through me, like a stargate in a sense. And then you look at Saturn as the adversary to the sun and the Saturn used to be the sun because Satan means adversary. Satan, Saturn might be connected Saturday, et cetera, Saturday worship. Yeah. So if you look at it astro theologically, like you said, the ancestors, every, they were happy. Everything was good. They were in this beautiful scenario. And then you know, all these plasma bolts start coming down and they got to start fending for themselves or getting hit. Just everything changes. And so they're trying to come up with this solution for it. Well, then if you read in Revelation, it talks about Lucifer, the falling star. Lucifer is connected to Isis, which is connected to Venus. So if Venus had something to do with these cataclysms when it was finding its orbit, that might make sense in a, um, in a metaphorical term. Like you're looking at it cryptically speaking and the ancestors are writing this stuff down. That's fascinating. I never connected those dots before. How, how long ago, Melissa, do you, do you think that this cataclysm happened that just changed everything? And, and, and do you think that's connected with the Grand Canyon and the Canyonlands as well? Um, well, according to their theory, because it's not mine. I just I just wrote the show. Um, is that um, it happened about ten thousand years ago, which kind of correlates with with everything that we're finding with all the ancient monuments, um, and uh, kind of like okay, where did this originate from? Does it go back to ten thousand years? Like everybody seems that's like the magic number. No matter who you are, right? No matter what researcher you are in this field, it seems to be ten thousand years. Something happened. What did it have? Like 
there's stories about the flood, there's master disasters, uh, there's gods coming down and punishing people. Uh, you know, okay, that all makes sense. It could have happened, but but their theory is basically going back to the fact this is a complete in electrical interaction, and the interactions they were having with with these electrical charges became gods and goddesses. And to your point, Venus, so that's another player in their theory, is that when Saturn was discharged, when it was it was being shut down, discharging this electrical energy because it now did not have the power it used to because the sun is now kind of taking that power, right? Our current sun. And in doing so, it's if, if you think of it, it's kind of, it, it's, it's, uh, like vibrating and moving because it's it's losing its charge and in doing so it spits out all this rock it just it just spits out all this rock from its core this is their theory that chunk of saturn uh becomes venus and so this wild piece of saturn that kind of uh gets destructively thrown out out of uh, out of its orbit um is also causing a lot of havoc for earth uh, and probably Mars. And um, because it doesn't have an orbit, it's this like molten rock just floating like out of uh, complete chaos. And of course they gave this name Venus. And so this is the, the terrible goddess, you know, the, the, the witch with the, you know, because the, uh, if you think of this massive piece of Saturn coming off of it, flying out of orbit, it's gonna be a, a, similar to a comet. So if you're an ancient person and you're looking up to the sky, you see this massive planet kind of with this huge comet trail. Uh, and in their theory, this is where the, the idea of the terrible goddess, the idea of the witch with the long hair, um, Kali, you know, snakes and like, ah, you know, Medusa. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's kind of where that comes from is because it was caught, it was also, coming close to earth and causing uh, a lot of destruction with electrical interactions between that planet and ours. But also, um, I mean, just think about when the moon is closer to earth, we have massive waves. And you know, this huge planet like coming close to earth, we have got earthquakes and uh, floods and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, just like just, so this, much to explain, <laughs> like <laughs> you're doing a great job. This is, I mean, you're explaining it in very easy to understand terms. So it's, it's not difficult. If, if I can understand it, everybody in the chat can, and we've got a, a nice crowd right now. And I don't, I don't see a single troll in there. What's going on. There's usually at least a few trolls in the chat. So this I'm is sure great. Uh, there, there's usually at least one, but the mods are doing a great job. But no, I'm looking through the comment section and everybody is seeming to understand this flawlessly. So this, this, is, this is great. And, and one thing that I'm attempting to understand is, so this, this huge event happens and, and, and then all of the, the orbits start going out of you know, place for the planets and cataclysms happen and such. Do you, have you read any of the, the Sumerian tablets like the Enuma Elish, the seven creation tablets? Yeah, yeah, of course. Do you think it kind of is describing maybe the, those events like Tiamat getting wasted by Marduk and, you know, all these battles and, and such? I, I'm wondering if that's what they're describing. I, mean, I think of it, they're all different groups of people watching the same event from different areas of the world. Uh, and they have to come up with an explanation. I mean, anytime that anything happens to a human being uh, that they cannot explain, right? Like something like, why would that happen to me? Uh, and, and they have no rational evidence to, to give an answer. It, it becomes this out of body experience. It becomes this, this, um, this thing that God controlled, right? Or, or the heavens or the gods or the goddesses. And so um, they have to come up with a reason why it happened. So they create these documents, they create these ancient scrolls of, of why things happened and who was there and who the players were and, and who was fighting Tiamat. Okay, so Tiamat, who's fighting Tiamat? If we take the electric universe theory, we have the terrible goddess and Mars, right? Like if I'm, a, if I'm an ancient human and I'm looking up, I see Mars, which is also very close to earth because uh, it's also trying to find an orbit and I see Venus, which is wildly crazy all over the sky. Mars is a little bit of a buffer between Venus 
and an earth. So the ancients uh, view this as kind of like he's the warrior. He's he's defending us from the terrible goddess, right? This sounds familiar with the uh, with Tiamat, you know, defeating the dragon, right? Why is she a dragon? Because it's this wild, crazy comet uh, with this like huge amounts of um, flaring red and green uh, plasma in the sky, and it looks like it looks like a, a dragon, but. I mean, again, sorry, now I'm, I'm going off, but, but there's no dragons on earth, right? So this is, this is a creature created by people that are watching it. Uh, and, and so like, you know, you look at all the other ancient texts, there's always the warrior, and then there's the, the evil goddess, there's, the, um, there's Zeus, you know, the lightning bolt, you know, there's all these players and they, the people had to come up with something. They had to come up with, well, what is happening in, in, in the sky? Like, you know, who's the bad guy? Who's, who's the good guy? Um, and we do that today. Like, that's just human, that's human nature. There has to be, for us to understand things, we create drama around them. We create characters, even if, um, even if, there's things like this, like mythology. There is truth to them. That that was a in their research. That was a real event that happened in the sky, and so we had to come up with names for them. It's just a way to pass it down in stories. It's right. uh, yeah, that that totally makes sense. Because they didn't know it was Mars and Venus, right? So they had to be like, uh, it's not really a planet. It was a goddess, and it was uh, a warrior. And it was really pissed off, <laughs> yeah. Cause, you know, because you think about it, and it talk, like these gods and goddesses. Some of them have fertility. Some of them have the opposite, like destruction and suffering, etc. And that totally makes sense. And then that Venus hypothesis with Lucifer, and then they take the name Lucifer, and you suffer is in there. And it's like, yeah, people are dealing with all these cataclysms. They're suffering because of these planets. But then after the planet goes back, and then things start to rebuild, it's beautiful. Like if you go to Moab. Moab, in my opinion, is a, is a if, if you want to see evidence of a cataclysmic event like biblical proportions, go to Moab because it's all right there. And now we've got Moab because of Venus. So it's like you don't want to be there 5,000 years ago whenever it you know, destroyed stuff. But now things are great. So that leads me to the next question. Have, have you all been able to put together like timelines on, on like these events every 5,000 years, every 12,000 years approximations? Um, uh, the, the real number is 10,000 years ago. So that was the big, the big reveal, you know, like, uh, if I'm, if I'm going to say it like an ancient human, that's when God got pissed and says, get the fuck out of the garden. <laughs> and, um, so, uh, so that's the big number now. So, but this, these events went over course of many years. So it wasn't like it just happened. And everybody was like, whoa, that was crazy. No, it happened over a course of probably a couple thousand years, according to the research. Um, but yeah, that's the 10,000 mark. That's like the big, this happened like 10,000 years ago. And so if that's true, that means that our solar system rearranged itself only 10,000 years ago, according to their theory. Now, do they... From my research, there's nobody in the EU community that believes in Planet X. Um, I, I think that Planet X might actually be Venus in some cases. It might have been Jupiter if you go back into the Enuma Elish. But, but what is your take on Planet X being a separate planet outside of the majors? Well, if I stick to this theory, because I do write on other stuff with, with Planet X or, you know, it's called different things by different people. Um, I, I think that um, in this theory, yes, that's not that's not the case. I mean, we do have an asteroid belt between uh, Mars and Jupiter, and then that's you know that could be a remnants of a, another planet. Um, I think that that's remnants of this disaster, actually, according to this theory. Um, that I think that that's what the remnants are of of that. Um, I think the idea of having a planet that was destroyed, I think goes back to the, to these ancient times where that, that there was something that they didn't understand, that there was, there was a, there was a place that, um, 
I think maybe they saw, maybe it was part of Mars and Venus having this battle or, or seeing other planets in the sky uh, in this interaction. Um, Jupiter is not really talked about in, in the EU theory a lot, according to Wall. I mean, there's some mention, but I, it's like a late player to the game or it, it wasn't involved as much as, as, as the, uh, the planets we're talking about. Um, but I think it's, it's, you know, according, I think if I could speak about through the electric universe theory, I think that the idea that there's a planet X is this human desire to want to believe that there was something good that was destroyed. That there was, that there was this other planet where life was great and, and it was destroyed. And that's why we have to deal with hell on earth type of thing. I mean, I'm speaking just from the Electric Universe here because I do cover a lot of different stuff with Planet X, uh, but I, I, that's what I would add for this theory. Okay, fantastic. And how old do you think the Earth is? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's like billions of years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so many theories. If, if this, uh, if this theory is correct, and we have these conversations about, well. Uh, you know, humanity has been on this planet for thousands and thousands of years longer than we think it is, millions of years possibly. Uh, that could be true, but we were living under the guise of a, a beautiful utopia, right? That, that, that that could be really true and that there's still evidence on this planet that uh, says that humans have been around a lot longer than we think they have. And also there's there's, I mean, just think of the dinosaur print with the, um, with the human footprint next to it. And I saw, I saw one of those in uh, Tuba City, Arizona, less than a year ago. I went out there and uh, the guy, this, this native took me on a tour and he showed me, he said, yep, here was a, a raptor. Here's a raptor print. Here's a human print. And he estimated them to be over 160 million years old based upon the rock. So yeah. fascinating. And there's so many petroglyphs of humans with dinosaurs. Right. Right. So that's what I'm saying. Like, we could have been on the planet for millions of years living under this kind of uh, red glow, uh, purple mist with all of our dinosaur friends for, for a very long time. It could, and then, and then 10,000 years ago, that was stripped away from us. And we had to try to explain that with symbolism. One of the important things uh, and the things that the, the ancient humans saw in the sky, according to this theory, is that when when they were looking up at the sky and they could see Saturn and it was massive, right? And then they could see Venus that was closest to uh, Saturn. And then it was uh, Mars, which had this red look to it. Um, when they looked up at this configuration, uh, if you think of it, Venus is, is now closer to Saturn. It's creating this plasma effect with the planet and it's having these offshoots of, of electric plasma interaction. So you're looking up at the sky and you kind of see these, these three planets in a row and you see all of these like massive streamers coming out of these planets on top of Saturn. And this is, in their theory, this is where the idea of the cross comes from or the onk um, or even the, uh, or the star or the pentagram. Like all of this comes from this moment in time where they were looking up there and going, what is that? And so everybody kind of had their own version of, of what that was. And, and to have it was the power of God, right? Because that was God up there. That was this, this massive show. So they would, they would make those symbols and they would say, this is God, right? Right. All over the world, people have different ideas of what that is because they interpret what they're seeing differently. That's fascinating. What's even more fascinating about it is it makes sense. <laughs> a lot of sense. <clears throat> right. Now, um, you talked about Saturn possibly having life. You talked about maybe even Mars having life because you said Martians. I think I heard that. Mm -hmm. So Iapetus uh, is an incredible moon that orbits Saturn. M Mimas is an incredible moon that orbits Saturn. Titan. So right. there's all these amazing planets or not planets, but moons that are, that are like planets. But do you think that I have you seen Iapetus and Mimas? I haven't been there. They look like the Death Star. They look like the Death Star is what I'm <laughs> You haven't been there? I thought yeah, you said. I know, I know, I know. I, okay. Like I've traveled. Everybody's been there. Have, I haven't been to those, those moons. Um, yeah, no, they but I. weird. Again, according, yeah. 
Well, they look like Death Stars, if you've seen them. They, like the, the Iapetus and Mimas, yeah. they look identical to the Death Star from Star Wars. So I, I was just wondering if you've seen those because you talked about life possibly being on those planets. Um, yeah, so I don't believe that there was life on Saturn, just life on Mars. And, uh, and, and their theory suggests that all of those moons are just literally just like how Venus was a piece of Saturn that kind of came off. It's the same thing with the, they just offshoot like these massive parts of Saturn as it's discharging uh, with this electrical interaction that was having. Um, that, that is their theory. Like, um, but I, I don't, I think that that was part of the interaction. They're not like, they weren't just floating around also with Mars and Earth. Mars and Earth, it was it's just Saturn and it's two little kids, Earth and Mars. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Um, Saturn's really interesting too because um, I wanted to add because you kind of brought it up later, but I wanted to add that I discovered that there is there there used to be um, there was a Greek holiday, Roman holiday called Saturnilla, which is a strange name just to say it sounds like some flavor Saturnilla um, <laughs> or a scent. Saturnilla uh, is a holiday where people would, uh, everything was reversed. Everybody could drink and eat whatever they wanted. Masters would serve their slaves. Women could hold court, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and everybody would get basically just eat and get drunk for like six or seven days, right? And they had a temple for Saturn and he was always wrapped up uh, every like every day of the year except for this 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 day and he was unwrapped so he could he could be free right so that everyone could be free like back in the old times like the golden era which is strange right that's what we're talking about and so it was an understanding that these people believed at one point Saturn had something to do with their golden era like this time when people were free and and everyone could be equal and everybody had a good time and there was there was no there was no work everyone was having you know maybe not drunk but right. but, you know. <laughs> right. but the funny thing it happened it was it started on december 17th and it went till the end of december when christianity came in they uh they changed that holiday to to christmas to jesus's birth uh obviously they wanted just you know it was already a holiday but let's Let's just move it over into this other holiday that we have. And it kind of fizzled out. Like people just stopped participating in it because this Christmas was much bigger. I just find that kind of um, interesting because some ancient culture before the Romans, before the Greeks, they had started it. So it was something that had been passed down without really any understanding of why they were celebrating Saturn. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. And actually what you said there I think kind of adds to the cryptic messages of the Bible being connected to astro theology, because so much of the Bible has adopted stories from previous scriptures, a lot of the Sumerian texts and stuff they've taken and just changed the names, but the same storyline. And as you say, they've, they changed dates and, and from the understanding that I've put together that the Bible is kind of a combination of multiple gods that they've attempted to bring into a monotheistic belief system. So that's why, you know, and, and anyway, it's, it's fascinating, especially when you connect the dots to the planets and the stars. And, and I just want to add another thing that, that I think is amazing when you brought up these, these pieces breaking out of Saturn. Um, if you look at Iapetus and Mebus, they, they look like artificial moons. They, they literally look like the Death Star and they have these, the, Iapetus has a 10 mile high, 10 mile wide circumference that goes around the entire moon. And then if you've seen Star Wars, that place where it shoots out the laser, that's where a big giant hexagon is. And it looks like it's made up of these hexagon panels. With that said, somatics being the universal code, you know, everything breaks down to a vibration and, and sounds are vibrations. If you look at Saturn and that big hexagon on Saturn, and then you look at Iapetus and these other planets, the way that you described it, that would explain how they're not artificial. If you connect somatics and you look at the universal language as above, so below, that's a, that's huge. That, that is really cool. So folks, we might be looking at just nature when you look at Iapetus. So there's a lot of people in the chat that have seen these plan these uh, moons that think they might be artificial as well. So, wow, that's incredible. That is absolutely incredible, Melissa. Um, where, where do we go now? This is great. Well, um, that's a good thing you brought up, though, as above, so below. So we're 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 trying. Um, 
a big part of this series is really trying to understand that if this theory is true and everything and of course i wall is going to do a better job at explaining um everything how it works from a physicist's point of view but if it's true that everything in the universe is connected on electric charge like everything runs on this on electricity if you will um that means that all in a sense not directly it's not the same charge but that means that all biological life on the planets run on a, a subtle energy as well right so we are affected by the planets it's not just you know your astrology report says this there is truth to that there is a, a truth to the planets in and finding its their alignments or how close they are or how they are in your chart however that works um there is truth to that because that charge although different not the same is is happening if, if that's what's happening in the universe it's also happening on a subtle level right here on earth between you and other biological systems between you and another human, between uh, the animals in the earth, between you and the earth, between you and the moon, between you and Mars, all that kind of stuff. That, is, that has some relevancy, which means that in a way, this theory, although trying to explain a disaster 10,000 years ago, is trying to also tell you and explain the, how we are all connected in the, the bigger picture through this kind of understanding of how the universe works. Yeah, this is exciting. And it's also kind of disturbing when you go back and you look at what you were taught in school and then, and then you look at some of the evidence, for example, the, uh, the plasma experiments that have been done that can confirm on a micro level, the Grand Canyon, the Canyon lands, many of these petroglyphs that are etched in stone that our ancestors saw. This is amazing. And folks, if you'd like to know more, if you want to see the, the details in depth, watch the series, go to Gaia.com slash Leak Project. You can sign up for free. I got my friends at Gaia to give Leak Project listeners free membership. So how cool is that? You like it, you love it, you keep it. It's just a few bucks a month. Um, but so you sign up, you watch the videos, and then I'm also going to upload. It should be uploaded by now. If it's not, it'll be uploaded here shortly. Go to leakproject.com and you can watch in full this video that is done with wall the electric universe wall thornhill it's absolutely incredible uh one thing that's kind of neat about gaia is they've got a little bit more money than me so they can put together some really nice <laughs> you can put together some really nice productions i love your work and like how often do you go like you turn on tv i've got a big screen upstairs and i've got probably five thousand channels and there's really nothing i want to watch you know and it's like oh, okay channel five channel five thousand it's all the same crap <laughs> and then you go to gaia and at least there's stuff on there that's fun to watch you know and, I've hit it like it's a lot of people that I've interviewed on Leak Project are on Gaia. And I didn't know that until like after the fact. That's pretty cool. Awesome. Yep. They they gave me this wonderful office. See? Can, can you see it? Isis? No, oh yeah, there's Isis. Right on. She's hanging out. Hanging yeah. Out. Right. That is so oh, cool. Speaking of, I'm because now I'm gonna get super nerdy. Um, so Good. Isis, um a, a Hathor is a version of Isis, right? So they always have this, the, the red disc with the gold horns. If on the top, you can't see it obviously because it's in my office, but everyone knows the symbol of, of the goddess with the, the red disc and the, and the gold horns. That's a representation of what they were seeing in the sky when they, they would see uh, the planet, um, the planets like the gold horns are actually like the planets behind them and the red disc is, is Mars. It's the same thing with uh, the eye of Horus, this idea where there was like the red pupil and then there was all this other planet plasma stuff happening. Um, so it's, it's like the, of course I can't do it justice. We have like seven episodes where we talk about this, but uh, all these, the symbolism is, is basically from that time. Like the people are trying to gather the power of the gods by, by, praying or uh, understanding the goddess or the gods and, and keeping their power, right? So the power of Isis and, and Hathor uh, is the power to control the sky, right? And, and you know what's, uh, what else is fascinating, Melissa, is if you actually take the brain and you look at the pineal gland, like you slice it, um, there I've seen images of that and it looks identical 
to the eye of Horus as well. So once again, as above, so below, the microcosm, the macrocosm. We see it in the heavens. We see it here on Earth. Um, you take an atom and you take everything orbiting around the atom, and then you look at the planets and the stars, and it's all just connected. So yeah, this is great. Cool. This yeah, is so cool. It's all connected. It's all connected. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here with us. I uh, had a great time with you, Melissa. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to spend it here with us at the Leak Project. Um, folks, have an amazing day. Definitely check out Gaia.com slash Leak Project. Get that free membership and watch the video in full at LeakProject.com and then watch the whole series at Gaia. Be excellent to each other and be the change you want to see. Thank you, Melissa. Awesome. Thank you.